This is Matt Britton. I'm the CEO of Suzy. I want to thank you for joining our third webinar uh, in the series of the state of the U.S. consumer. Uh, as many of you on the phone know, we have been doing a significant amount of research on the U.S. consumer and how they've been impacted uh, by this COVID-19 crisis um, ever since it started the last week of February. It's been really fascinating from a marketing and market research standpoint just to see all the changes and how quickly uh, I believe we've gone through years and years of consumer evolution in just a couple of weeks here as consumers try to grapple with this crisis and what it means for them. So I hope you get a lot of value uh, out of this presentation. Um, another thing that I often get asked um, is will this presentation be available? And, and the answer is yes, we will be video recording uh, the presentation. Um, for everybody and saying you guys links out afterwards. So let's get started. Uh, first and foremost, for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, Suzy is a real-time market research platform. Um, we, we launched Suzy in 2018 and are now working with hundreds and hundreds of leading brands to really help them have the finger on the pulse of consumers. We have our own US-based consumer panel of over a million people that we allow our customers to target for real-time on-demand insights on what consumers are thinking and feeling at the moment. And of course, this is the tool we primarily use for today's research. In terms of our company, we are now um, 80 plus uh, employees all in the United States. We, like I'm sure many of you guys on the phone, have been doing everything we can to just try to get through this together. Um, we've been all pitching in into various departments. We make sure that we're connecting on an ongoing basis, and we find ourselves to be one of the fortunate companies that seem to be uh, performing fairly well through this, just because the tool that we provide seems to be in demand by so many businesses of all types as the nature of the consumer changes daily. So today's uh, presentation is based upon uh, market research that we conducted. Um, we will cite third party research throughout the presentation, but primarily it is through our own first party research that we created with the Suzy platform. There are two studies. Part one was launched on April 10th with a sample size of about a thousand people. Part two on April 15th to a lesser sample size of about 650 people. Um, and of course, all the samples are directionally representative US consumers, census weighted by age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So that is generally how we uh, got this research and let's dive into it. So first and foremost, you know, it came up for us when we were thinking about this crisis and the evolution of it, that it almost aligns with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I'm sure many of you are really familiar with where when this crisis first hit, many consumers were largely concerned with the physiological impact to their well-being. Will I have a place to sleep? Will I have food to eat? And then very quickly, once uh, you know there was news about people making a rush on banks and, and on grocery stores, people ultimately started to fear for their safety. And that's when they started to stockpile and that's when they started to really act in a way that maybe was distancing them from those around them because they weren't really quite sure where this was gonna go. And now we've kind of entered a different phase, a phase where consumers are really starting to redirect um, you know, their focus away from those core needs hierarchy, uh, core hierarchy of needs and towards things like love and belonging and even getting to a place of self-empowerment and esteem. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but I just think it's interesting when you look at you know, the basic human needs and how this crisis kind of stripped everything down to its core and slowly but surely consumers are building back to their notion of what humanity really is. And to dive deeper in this, you can almost look at a timeline. Um, when I am asked about this 15, 20 years from now, what was the one moment I remember this, of this crisis when I really got freaked out and scared? It was the night of March 11th where uh, me being a big basketball fan, the NBA season was canceled. And at the same time, Tom Hanks, a famous actor, it was, he was kind of the first uh, mainstream celebrity that got diagnosed or announced he was diagnosed uh, with coronavirus. And that really was the moment that evening um, that many of us will really remember as when this whole crisis really started. And along with that, what I call fear and confusion phase, we had things like a 400% increase in Purell sales. And at the very end of this first fear and confusion phase, we saw the Dow Jones drop a record nearly 3,000 points um, in one day. So that was, you know, 
kind of the bottoming out of people being incredibly scared about this. And then consumers start to really get into an empowerment or protection phase. Um, the CDC declared a national emergency on March 15th, and stores right away start to really ramp up, but continue to sell out of real essential supplies, whether it be toilet paper, thermometers, frozen foods. Consumers were really trying to protect um, their family. They, they had concerns about the supply chain, and they really didn't know how long this was going to last for, and if there would be a time where they'd be locked in their homes and wouldn't be able to access um, basic needs like food for their family. At the end of the protection phase, around March 27th, uh, the U.S. announced that there was about 100,000 uh, COVID-19 cases, which uh, seems so big at the time, but seems so small right now, unfortunately. As we entered April, we start to enter a period of adjustment because consumers really start to realize, like, I could be here for a while. This, this is going to be sort of something that we adjust to for a longer period of time. Majority of U.S. public schools started to announce closures, so parents had to reevaluate how they were going to, um, you know, care for their children while trying to juggle the workplace. At that point, about two thirds of America were sheltered in place. And you had things like webcams up 170% as uh, many employees had to come to the realization that my new office is my home. And then we, we entered a phase where I believe we are now, which is what we'll call the acclimation phase. And in the acclimation phase, you know, consumers are starting to A, see a light at the end of the tunnel. But B, they're starting to realize that some of the habits that they are actually adopting during this period may be part of what the world may be moving forward. So again, we've moved from a time where it started with, I don't know what the future holds, to I need to protect my loved ones, to we may be here for a while. And now as a result of this, of this crisis lasting so long, you're starting to see new consumer habits form. And today's presentation is really focused on the core areas that we see new habits being formed that may have a lasting impact on the US consumer. And those are food, um, shopping, the home, um, you know, how consumers entertain themselves in the home, work, and what is the future of work, as well as school and education. Those are really the core areas that we're going to dive into today. And if you have questions, uh, you, you, there's a Q&A button that you probably see um, as part of the Zoom interface. Feel free to ask questions and we will answer them just as quickly as we can. So, um, as we mentioned, we are in this acclimation phase, and there's really four hallmarks that we found in talking to consumers about the acclimation phase. The first of which is a great reduced fear about supply chain reliability. As I mentioned earlier, when this get at the onset of the crisis, many consumers really were concerned: Will I be able to get food? When will things sell out? Will I not be able to get water or bread or eggs or milk? And that, that fear has greatly reduced as consumers have had successful trips to the, to the shopping market or ordering online and getting needs that the, the food that they need it. And as a result, that fear is not as heightened anymore. And it kind of got crossed off of their list. And now they're getting acclimated to the new world of eating, which we'll get into. New routines are being established, uh, both within remote work and remote learning environments. Consumers have to learn how to go to school from their bedroom or go to work from their basement like I'm doing right now. And those routines were first, you know, kind of a shock to the system and getting set up. But now consumers are, are having a routine, whether it's, you know, walking downstairs to the kitchen in the morning and getting their morning coffee or going for a run in the morning or taking out 45 minutes in the middle of the day to work out. These routines are being established and now consumers are kind of getting adjusted to a new way of working and learning. Families are also getting readjusted to a new financial reality. They are rebudgeting the, their lifestyles to really be reframed with their new um, financial world. Many consumers obviously have been laid off. Many consumers have applied on behalf of their business for the payroll protection program. Um, others are still waiting on unemployment um, checks and benefits to come in from the local municipalities. But regardless, the plans that consumers have had in terms of the things they want to invest in, whether it's buying a house or going on vacation or planning a wedding, those things have been really re-examined and families are re-looking at a new reality moving forward and adjusting their expenditures accordingly. And then lastly, relationship structures are becoming evolved. The way that people are interacting with family members and friends and the expectations from those in our social circle are changing. We can no longer have our bi-weekly dinner um, that some of us had with some of our close friends or you know, meeting a, a good friend for coffee every morning before work. 
those are no longer options, you know, right now. And as a result, there's these new frameworks being developed, whether it's people having daily Zoom, uh, you know, calls with their with their friend group or FaceTiming your, your parents every night before you go to sleep because you haven't seen them in so long. So we're starting to see really new relationship structures as well. So let's dive deeper into food because food, I would argue, is the probably category that is going to see the biggest lasting impact and really tectonic shift in terms of how consumers looked at eating and buying food prior and how they're going to be looking at it moving forward. Um, first and foremost, consumers are buying now less food than they have two weeks ago. 44% of US consumers have said they're shopping for less food over the past two weeks. And 57% say they're actually stockpiling less food. And you see that, or at least I do, in the supermarket where you know, as, as little as two to three weeks ago, when you go to a supermarket, the, you know, the, the shelf space would be empty, whether it be for produce or whether it be for milk or flour. And now you're seeing those items becoming restocked. So despite some, you know, very recent news about maybe some food supply chain issues, especially when it comes to the meat industry, because there's been an outbreak of viruses and a lot of the meat packing facilities in the U.S. here in America, consumers are more confident as a result, they are stockpiling less food. And we dug deeper into that on Suzy and asked consumers, how long will your current supply last before restocking in a variety of different categories? And what we started to realize is that, um, you know, food is actually the, the one area where consumers more than um, half actually said, um, you know, they only have about a few weeks left of inventory. And you can actually see down this list where um, consumers are most stocked up in areas like uh, beauty products and medicine, because a lot of them did so much stockpiling for medicine before this started. And they're least stocked up in an area like food, um, at where only 11% say so they have a few months left um, of food and actually 31% of consumers say they only have a few days worth of food. So even though they are shopping less, they actually have less long-term stockpiled inventory um, in that area, if you will. And this was a big shift from even a couple of weeks ago where you saw consumers believing that they had uh, months and months of supplies of food and you know they're getting adjusted to what they really need and they're adjusting their shopping habits accordingly. Another huge shift that we've started to see from consumers, and this is one area where I certainly believe will have a lasting impact, is that 34% now are buying more groceries online than just two weeks ago. That's a massive increase. And obviously, many consumers look at going to the supermarket as a huge risk right now. Um, you know, God bless the, the people who are on the front lines in the food supply chain, whether it be the, you know, the cashiers or the people who are restocking the shelves, because they are also at risk. Um, but for consumers, they don't necessarily see the benefit of going to the supermarket as much as they used to anymore. And they're getting to be more reliant upon, um, I'm more used to ordering grocery shopping online. Another thing consumers have changed as a result of this whole crisis is they are now having to buy brands that they typically didn't purchase prior because the brands that they once relied on, at least at some point during this crisis, were not in stock. So whether it be a brand of toilet paper or shampoo or toothpaste or a, or a brand of um, a food item like orange juice, the, the brand that they might have trusted the most. And what we have found throughout this is that consumers have veered towards the household brands. In a world we were headed before this where there are all these upstarts, it's the household CPG food and beverage brands that consumers are really veering back to. Um, you know, And because of that, when they don't get those brands that they want, they've had to try new brands. But what's interesting is that 50% of consumers, 57% said that they're very likely to continue buying those new brands after this ends. So it has allowed some maybe secondary and tertiary players in certain spaces to enter into the consideration set for consumers who weren't able to get the main household or market leader in a certain category. And it'll be interesting to see if you are one of those brands that might have had an uptick, perhaps because the stock of the market leader was in place. It's going to be interesting to see how those brands continue that loyalty with consumers when the main market leaders products continue to flow into the shelf more so as it already is. Consumers are also eating different types of food. Um, more than half claim they're eating more snack food than ever. I'm definitely guilty of that. You're home all day. You're, all of your kids' um, food is at home. You're, you're stockpiling uh, 
certainly more than you have in the past, things like chips, things like pretzels and cookies, and it's just there and it's driving much more consumption with consumers, especially older consumers um, throughout this crisis. And all of this in terms of the, the crisis and impact has really driven home the notion that consumers need to be much more self-sufficient when it comes to preparing their own food, which creates an opportunity that we like to call brand as ingredient, which is 81% of consumers have actually cooked more meals at home since the onset of the crisis. And as a result, consumers are no longer as reliant upon obviously restaurants and even to a lesser extent delivery services. And now when they're looking at brands and they're, and they're going online and they're going to Fresh Direct or, or Amazon to actually buy groceries, they're looking at food a lot more through the lens of the food as an ingredient versus a finished product. Um, and this is a massive shift than what we've seen really over the last 50 years. Because over the past 50 years, we've actually uh, gradually migrated away from this trend where food eaten away from home, finally, as of the year 2013, after a 50-year kind of divergence and pass, actually equaled the amount of food eaten at home. So you see, back in 1963, over 70% of food uh, consumption was actually for food eaten at home, and only 20% was at food away from home. And you can see they both kind of met at the 50% level going towards this. And what we really start to see with these trends that are going on is a continuation of the upward trend of food um, of food actually um, eaten away from home. Um, so basically, it's going to have a divergent path. And maybe food at home might bounce back up again and start to go almost like backwards in time, if you will. So, you know, it's gone down to 50%. There's a good chance that that number might spike up to 55, 60, 70% and really have this big shift. And we'll have to see if that happens um, on the long term, but on the short term, there's no doubt that we start to see a completely new class of chefs emerge in the American household. 75% uh, of US consumers that are over 21 years old said that as a result of the crisis, they are now more skilled in the kitchen and I guess on the kitchen as well. Um, and more than half believe they will continue to cook more after the crisis. So I do not know how to cook and I've tried, I only know how to make grilled cheese and peanut butter and jelly. I think I've gotten pretty good at that, but I guess I'm the exception, uh, not the norm. Many other people in my household, um, including my 14 year old daughter, who's become a complete master chef through this, um, actually have really embraced the notion of cooking at home. Um, we, we actually did some research, third-party research, to see what are the most Googled recipes since the crisis. And these are the top five um, you know, dishes that we found. You have desserts like uh, banana bread and chocolate cake. Uh, you have uh, everyday meals like pizza and chicken. And then you have morning dishes like French toast. But these are the most Googled recipes. So if you are a brand that could be an ingredient as part of this, and maybe you typically in the past weren't selling in that format, Ingredient brands are definitely going to be on the upswing with all these trends that are actually occurring in the food space. And larger companies like IKEA are taking note. Uh, those of you who've ever shopped at IKEA know that they have amazing meatballs. You know, IKEA is a Swedish brand and it would make sense that they would have uh, Swedish meatballs as kind of their core recipe. And a lot of people who went to IKEA went to their little cafe and loved eating the Swedish meatballs and you can't go to IKEA right now. So what IKEA has done, the respond is they've actually served out the recipe on how to make IKEA meatballs at home. And I think that's a great example of a brand understanding the shift, understanding that Although they are a furniture brand, consumers had brand love for IKEA in part because of the meatballs that they served at their cafe at the store. And then to continue with that, even though the store is closed, for them to actually offer up these recipes, obviously, and it looks like IKEA instructions, like you're building um, a desk, uh, but thankfully it doesn't look like it comes with 130 parts like most IKEA products do. And um, that, I thought that was an interesting way that IKEA was going about keeping that brand love. We're also going to start to see, I believe, a big shift in the, the way that right now um, order in food has been kind of deployed in this new era in America. We all know companies like DoorDash and Postmates and Grubhub have had a huge run in Uber Eats as of late in terms of delivery services that U.S. consumers really rely on in the world where they were ordering more food. 
But what we start to see um, in an era where so many restaurants are struggling dramatically is a big pushback both at the business level and at the municipality level for capping the delivery app fees for restaurants. This story just came out today that Chicago considers capping the delivery app fees for restaurants at 5%. And I believe this is going to drive more of a shift to more bespoke or proprietary delivery networks where if you are a restaurant, a, a chain, you will probably now be investing maybe in your own app and your own delivery people and your own infrastructure because this is essentially the front line of your brand. And are you going to be um, you know, outsourcing into a company that really impacts your margin or in a world where maybe less consumers will be going into your physical restaurant in the future, does it make sense for you to save the, the outsized delivery fees and actually create your own delivery network? So I think we're going to see more and more of this um, go the way of the Domino's model, so to speak, where all sorts of different restaurants or maybe consortiums of restaurants in certain cities will kind of come together and create their own network of their own white labeled app and their own delivery service moving forward to really try to buck the trend that we were seeing uh, before this. So when we start to ask consumers, you know, what is the future of how you eat? And this goes back to that chart again, where we saw, um, you know, eating out really dramatically over the last 50 years, um, get to the level of eating at home. You know, we believe that it's going to continue to more consumers are going to eat at home moving forward. You know, more consumers actually did agree with this. We have now 40% of consumers saying they're going to be eating out less and cooking more than before. They're more confident. It's part of the family routine. They're less, um, you know, I think, uh, comfortable about, as, at least right now, going into restaurant environments. And as a result of all of these things, you, you know, we could really see this continuing trend of in-home meal preparation for consumers and the art of cooking coming back in almost full circle um, here in America. In terms of drinking, 45% of adults, 21 to 54, said they're drinking more beer, wine, or spirits at home than usual um, over the past month. So you're starting to see, obviously, consumers are not going out to bars or restaurants or sporting events. And because of that, you know, obviously, it would make sense that more consumers would be um, drinking at home. But this has been a big boon for the liquor and beer and spirits industry because, you know, the on-premise business has basically evaporated. If, you're, if you were selling your product in bars or restaurants, that channel is all but gone right now. But thankfully for a lot of companies in this category, they've more than made up for that lost volume by off-premise sales. And when we dug deeper into the nature of the off-premise sales, what we started to see, and this at least came as a surprise to me, is that consumers are actually buying alcohol in physical stores predominantly. Uh, over 60% of consumers are still buying alcohol in physical stores. I think a big reason for that is that Amazon does not deliver alcohol. So that obviously is the de facto way that many consumers are ordering alcohol. And you obviously, that's not an option um, on Amazon, at least not that I'm aware of. And you know, now as a result, you're seeing more consumers go to physical stores, but you are seeing a shift to home delivery services from Postmates um, and Fresh Direct, as well as uh, bespoke alcohol delivery services like Drizzly and Mini Bar that are really driving a lot of growth uh, through this. So it'll be interesting to see what happened. And I don't know how many of you saw this trend pop up actually uh, I think two nights ago on Twitter but Stanley Tucci a great actor came up with a YouTube video on how to make the perfect Negroni and the way he did so in the video was just so calming and um, classic if you will in terms of the way it was filmed and it, you know this actually went viral um, on YouTube and on Twitter and it's just interesting if I were in the beer and liquor category or really any company in the food category I would just be over investing in bespoke content how are you using um, you know, my, my food or my beverage or my liquor in ingredients? What am I going to cook tonight? How can you collaborate with your friends and family members and all cook the same thing together and share how it tastes? It is such an unmet need right now and such a massive opportunity for the food and beverage business to overinvest in content, overinvest in pushing out ingredients and, and tools that allow you to connect with others, bring the social aspect and the functional aspect of cooking back to American households because it's a trend, a 50 year trend that looks to be starting to reverse and there's gonna be massive reverberations um, in the food and beverage industry that we're gonna see coming out of this. So moving on to retail and how are consumers shopping and what does acclimation look like for consumers when it comes to actually shopping? 
Well, the first thing we want to do is actually see what are the categories that have grown the most throughout this crisis in terms of volume. And we look specifically at e-commerce just because that's data that's readily available right now. And obviously many retailers aren't even able uh, to be open. And going back to my earlier point of just in-home preparation, look at bread machines up 652%. Um, many consumers at the very early part of this crisis were really worried about being able to get bread and many of them purchased bread machines or, or learned. And all of a sudden that became the fastest growing um, category in e-commerce. Obviously we saw things like cough and cold uh, really spike. And that's why consumers obviously have such a big stockpile of, of product in that category is because they really went online and, and tried to buy everything they could in that area. Huge wealth, health and wellness phase um, coming through America right now. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in this presentation. But you have things like um, weight training that is obviously something that consumers need products for because they're no longer relying on going to the gym. And that's why you see yoga equipment, weight training, and those type of products really selling. We're going to talk about work a little bit later and computer monitors and, and webcams are, are, are selling out dramatically. Um, and then you have things like DIY elements, whether it be craft kits um, where you can actually make your own crafts at home or hair coloring, which we'll get into. Um, and of course, uh, spices and seasonings. And these are just some of the fastest growing categories um, that we thought were really notable. And then conversely, when you look at the fastest declining um, categories, it's no surprise that it really um, is in the categories that largely have to do with travel and big events in people's lives. You know, suitcases and luggage are down 77% because people don't really have anywhere to go. Um, the sale of cameras is largely driven by big new trips. If you're going on a safari, maybe you'll buy a new camera, you're going on a trip and consumers don't really find the need for those cameras and for home photos, the iPhone is just fine. Obviously we've seen um, weddings and formal events uh, get canceled off the calendar and other parties, which is why you see bridal clothing and formal wear go away. Um, so, it, you know, none of this really comes as a surprise. Will these uh, businesses bounce back? Well, we'll get into that a little bit later. To me, the, the nuggets here were really more about the fastest growing products than the fastest declining products, because these are all things, unfortunately, that we know have to do with huge impacts to certain sectors as a result of this crisis. So we ask consumers also not just what they're buying more of, but where are they shopping more? And what we learned very quickly is that, and again, it comes as no surprise that online retailers, whether it be you know Amazon or Fresh Direct or any online retailer, is really seeing a huge boom through this. And categories that maybe did not hit mainstream or were on their way to hitting mainstream, groceries being the biggest. You know, when Amazon bought Whole Foods a couple of years ago, we looked at that really as a hallmark moment that wow, grocery sh uh, shopping online line is really going mainstream start to happen in some of the top tier coastal cities but really was not as fast to get adopted as some thought it would in other cities but now we're seeing a huge acceleration of that uh, we're seeing a, a, a growth also in uh, things like home delivery uh, you know people trust Target and Costco and the and you know the the wholesale stores for home delivery um, and they're leaning into really those bespoke retailers to ship directly um, and you can kind of see um, the list so on so on in terms of where consumers are buying more of but really online retailers that are driving so much growth through this we're also seeing a huge increase in what we call and I learned this term I kind of like it called BOPIS which is buy online, pick up in store. I'm sure many of you in the retail and CPG category have been using this term for a very long time. Um, I knew what it was, I just didn't know that cool acronym. But many consumers are trusting BOPIS now as a way to get products because there is still some sliver of distrust about the speed of the supply chain. And we're seeing Amazon nowhere as quick in terms of delivering products as it was pre-crisis. And many consumers will opt for um, buy online, pick up in store, A, because they, they feel like it's a more reliable way of getting their product in time, and B, they're just looking for something to do. So many consumers, you know, want something to do, you know, a trip to Walmart or Target now is kind of like a trip to Disney World because it gets you out of the house and it, you're seeing a whole new world and it gives uh, consumers a reason to go there. And by them picking up in store or curbside, obviously they lessen the risk and we're seeing a huge boom in that right now. I think a big change in the retail landscape is 
a ton of headwinds coming for what was a massive upstart of direct to consumer brands um, coming into it, whether it's away luggage or whether it's a brand like um, Casper or um, you know a company like Quip that sells um, electronic uh, toothbrushes. These are companies um, much like Dollar Shave Club, which uh, was since acquired um, by Unilever. But you know, there basically are these companies that really won very early on by being first to market and direct to consumer. They controlled uh, the entire uh, supply chain. They had great customer service. They gave consumers uh, better costs. And what they actually start to do in the last couple of years is despite the fact that they started online, they start to build actually a retail footprint in major store in major cities to really give consumers more brand trust. In a lot of instances, companies like Casper would buy a retail foot, footprint in major cities really as a loss leader and almost as a marketing channel and somewhere you can come and touch and feel the products, but the, the vast majority of their sales were happening online. And actually what we're starting to see through this is massive deteriorations in businesses like Casper. And you have to look no further than the search volume where you can actually see, you know, from let's just say February where the search volume for, for the brand has been nearly halved. Uh, less and less people want to buy um, from a company like Casper. And I think there's a lot of reasons why. One of which is that I mentioned earlier, in a time of crisis, consumers will go back to the brands that they love and trust. And you cannot replace 20, 30, 40 years of brand equity and brand trust with three years of outsized uh, venture capital fueled spent. And I think what we're starting to see right now, um, despite all the conversation about is branding dead, is the brand dead, is the power of brands come back into play. And conversely, we're seeing companies like Costco, which was a legacy bricks and mortar brand, actually go the other way now and they're accelerating their e-commerce. Uh, so again, you saw Casper, an upstart DTC brand um, online, start to kind of play into the brick and mortar space, but now conversely, you're seeing the op opposite really happen for brands that traditionally weren't, didn't have a big online presence, and Costco is really investing heavily in e-commerce, for example. <clears throat> and we start to see a lot of shift and, and swirl in the e-commerce space, even head heading into this crisis. You know, it was just as recently as back in November, which seems like, a hundred years ago at this point, but you know, Nike basically announced that they're going to be ditching Amazon and selling directly to consumers because they actually want it to um, control the experience. And Nike is such an incredible brand. And for them, they thought they were somewhat cheapening it um, by actually selling through Amazon directly. And obviously they're giving up share and volume through that, but they're, they're trying to establish themselves as more of a premium brand. And it's going to be really interesting to see coming out of this, if more volume in more categories actually does shift online, it could then necessitate brands to invest more into that channel. And Nike, for example, is also looking at direct-to-consumer subscription models, uh, where basically you could have a subscription of Nike shoes for your kids because their feet grow so fast. And you know, I think you're going to see more and more um, traditional companies that were relying on Amazon as a channel now they have enough volume to justify it because less consumers are going out into stores to really accelerate their um, you know, direct-to-consumer e-commerce plans. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Um, and then lastly, on the retail front, we had started to see some data um, that consumers uh, really were concerned about buying products from China. Um, and that, that number um, actually continues to drop. Um, less consumers now are concerned about buying um, products from China. And the easiest way to explain that is that, you know, three or four weeks ago, this was predominantly a Chinese issue, or maybe six weeks ago, and now it's much more of a US issue. So I think, you know, despite what some news outlets might be saying, um, ultimately, this is a global issue, and it's hitting here at home on US soil more than anywhere. So consumers aren't as um, quick to basically associate this as a problem, a Chinese problem. As a result, they're not as concerned as much anymore about buying brands that are sourced from China. So that's an interesting change. So next is the home. How are consumers acting differently in the home? Well, it should come as no surprise that nearly 60% of consumers are consuming somewhat or significantly more 
television, social media. I mean, in a lot of instances, what else is there to do? Um, and consumers really are, have leaned into digital entertainment more than ever before. And obviously for millennials and Gen Z, you know, they're digital natives and they were born into this environment. But what this is really doing is for uh, baby boomers, for example, it's really starting to facilitate, I mean, I don't know how many times my parents have called me. I know my dad's listening down in Florida, so shout out to my dad, Bob. But, um, you know, how many times he's called me to actually, um, you know, ask to set up something on Apple TV or a streaming service because generally speaking, for a lot of baby boomers, they, they didn't adopt a lot of these tools. Not everybody. There's a lot of digitally savvy baby boomers, but it's starting to drive a big shift um, in streaming, arguably in cord cutting. And this might be the one event that really facilitates, you know, the move away from traditional linear television, uh, more much more further to a programmatic TV-based approach. Um, and obviously you see platforms like Netflix um, booming. Uh, Quibi is a streaming service that came out that, you know, for them, unfortunately, Quibi is a service that uh, is really built for more of a mobile age. It's all built around your mobile device. And with people commuting less, um, you know, that, that new form of entertainment is probably less appealing to a consumer now, but there's no reason to believe that won't come back once consumers start uh, commuting again. But obviously, Netflix and Hulu, Amazon, the big winners um, in the streaming space. We asked consumers also about their beauty routines um, because there was a big belief that maybe many consumers, um, you know, didn't care about putting on makeup anymore, but actually 40% of kept the same skincare makeup routine. And when we dug deeper into that with consumers, there's the habitual, habitual nature of just the routine of getting ready in the morning that many of them found comfort and not changing despite the fact they weren't actually leaving the house. But there were over a third that have explored new skincare makeup routines. Um, so there has been some change to the beauty space, but I don't think it's been um, as severe as many would have thought it was actually going into this. In terms of apparel, you know, we've actually seen a massive increase in traffic to online apparel retailers since the crisis. And because of it, it's really helped for some companies, again, especially for the more digitally native retailers, really um, offset some of the massive impacts to obviously national store closures. Now, some companies that weren't digitally native going into this, it unfortunately could mean, um, you know, the end for them. You look at Neiman Marcus, which just filed for bankruptcy last week, you know, they're not going to be the last one. I can tell you that of traditional retailers, specialty retailers that just will not be able to find a way out of this. A lot of them were hanging on to a thread before this. And unfortunately, a lot of those traditional retailers, those big brands actually may never come back. Or since the brand actually does have such great brand equity, maybe somebody else will license them. And we'll see them in a different form, much like uh, what was happening with Toys R Us when they unfortunately announced their bankruptcy last year. Um, Sales has also boomed, especially for pure play fashion retailers, uh, which actually um, had a 37% increase in sales during the week of April 9th. So you're seeing these pure play fashion retailers really taking advantage um, of their you know, the ability to acquire customers and stay top of mind. And obviously the prevalence of first party data to be able to drive through discounts um, and, and really smart content and marketing and increase and really, again, um, take a lot of share. And this is a, a share shifting, uh, you know, mo movement that we're starting to see. And, you know, the traditional brick and mortar, especially retailers, again, such pressure and those digitally native brands are really starting to come in and expand their share. Um, I have a lot of question on where the future is of a company like Rent the Runway, which was exploding and really disrupting the apparel space before this happened. Um, where I live in Dumbo outside of Brooklyn, um, they have a partnership with WeWork where if you return your clothes to a receptacle like this, you can get a new shipment the same day. And on an everyday basis, you had lines of women waiting to return their clothing. Um, because Rent the Runway, for those of you who don't know, allows you to you know, rent clothing like you used to maybe rent a Netflix DVD. And once you're done, you return it and you get more clothing. It's a subscription-based service. The question I have is, will consumers be as comfortable sharing clothes after this? Will the, are they concerned that maybe the clothes will contain the virus or be less uh, you know, sanitary? Maybe, maybe not. If I'm Rent the Runway, which I think is a business that has such tremendous opportunity long-term, I am thinking about right now messaging hard about how the, you know, the sanitization of their clothing once it's returned because you know, the mechanics of a rent the runway model is so incredibly appealing 
to millennials. And the question is, will that continue um, given everything and, and kind of new concerns that consumers have? And lastly, at home, I mean, gaming has exploded. Verizon uh, recently uh, reported that there's been a 75% increase in online gaming during peak hours um, over their network. And consumers are playing video games more often, more often than ever before. Um, males, obviously, more than females, just because traditionally gaming has um, veered towards males, but it's driving many more females and many more casual gamers into the fray. Um, you probably have all heard about Animal Crossing, which is a Nintendo game, which has exploded as a result of this. That's a great example of a casual family game that's bringing way more um, gamers into the fold and, and way more bio, buyers, ultimately. And with that, you're seeing more families actually um, allowing their, their kids to play video games more. Um, you know, you want to keep your kid busy, especially if you have to work or you just want to need a break and you don't have childcare. Um, parents are being much more lenient about allowing their kids to play video games. Um, and in that regard, uh, nearly half are also playing video games more frequently with their child. And video games isn't just sort of a, uh, you know, interactive tool that kids are doing by themselves in the basement anymore. It's actually now impacting mainstream sports. So um, NASCAR had an esports uh, event uh, over on ESPN where you could actually watch a video game of, of, you know, NASCARs racing against each other. And Danny Hamlin, a very successful race car driver, actually said that he actually received more interviews about this race, even though it wasn't a real car race than he normally gets after regular uh, NASCAR uh, events. So talk about esports and esports was a burgeoning, uh, you know, industry prior to this. A lot of people don't understand why consumers want to watch other people play video games, but especially in a world devoid of live sports, it's pretty exciting, I have to say. And, um, you know, to see that the, the media interest was just as heavy as it was for a regular NASCAR event. Well, that's really, you know, interesting. And you are starting to see some trickles of more traditional live sports come back into the fray. Um, you know, two Hall of Fame golfers, Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods, actually um, have announced just, I think, this morning that they're going to be playing a golf match, a foursome, with NFL stars, uh, retired star uh, um, Peyton Manning, as well as Tom Brady, strangely newly of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And they're going to have, obviously, one football and one player and one golfer play together. But they're going to be playing it live. I guess they'll each have their own golf cart. They certainly can all afford it. And it's going to be one of the first live events. It's going to be for charity. And it's going to be really interesting. This is a charity, you know, celebrity event that would have very, um, you know, mixed viewership. But this could actually be incredible viewership in a world where there are, is nothing like the Masters um, for golf fans or even sports fans to watch. Another trend that we're hearing a lot about is uh, for the summer, especially is drive in movie theaters. Um, and you know, there's people are two ways about the future of movie theaters. Some people say that movie theaters are going to be done and they're not going to exist. Um, I'm of the mindset that there's still room at kind of both edges of the barbell. Those of you who hear me speak know I often talk about the barbell economy. And I think luxury movie theater chains, whether it be um, something like iPick where you can order your food, uh, I think those are gonna continue to do well. And then I also think you're gonna have a surge in these type of events like drive-in movie theaters where people feel safe because they're in their car, but it actually allows them to get out. Um, with all that being said, you are seeing now first run movies go directly to on demand. Uh, and, you know, for consumers at home, you know, they're basically like, well, that's not so bad. I get to watch these amazing movies at home. It's going to be interesting to see. We also did some research a little later, which we'll talk about in terms of do consumers really miss going to movies. Um, and obviously, fitness is huge. People need to stay fit. They need to stay active. Uh, Two thirds of those um, engaging in fitness routines say they intend to do in-home fitness routines uh, post-crisis. Uh, we at Suzy um, hire a great trainer who actually um, trains our entire company once a week. And given that he can see everyone that's working out, um, for those of us who turn our cameras on, like it really is a great experience. And you really do feel like you get a good workout, even if you're not with the trainer in person. So that's another example of something that may stick. Um, Peloton, interestingly, was holding on to doing live classes from studios up until April 3rd. Then unfortunately one of their instructors uh, contracted the virus and now their, their uh, instructors are actually doing it from home. The biggest boom by far in what we're seeing right now, uh, you know, in terms of at home activities is this huge surge in DIY 
do-it-yourself consumer empowerment. Uh, you look at the Google search volume over the last six months for DIY and you see a massive spike, uh, basically almost doubling in terms of consumers looking for content on ways to do things on their own. Uh, I love this, uh, you know, the whole phrase that Home Depot came out years and years ago, you can do it, we can help. And I think right now, that phrase really needs to apply to almost every single brand because brands need to enable now consumers to do things on their own because so many service options have dwindled. And now many consumers are left to their own devices. Let's just look at the category Home Depot is in, which is home improvement, home repairs. You know, if, you, if your toilet is clogged or your dishwasher is broke, you're much less likely right now to have a repair person come to your house. And as a result, what are you gonna do? You're gonna search online for ways that you can do it yourself before uh, using somebody coming to your home and possibly putting your family at risk as a last resort. And I think so many brands right now need to start thinking about themselves as enablers because there's been so many services in the past that consumers, again, have relied on that really aren't accessible. And this is another example of something that may stick because if you figure out how to do something on your own right now, are you really gonna pay somebody else to do it for you in the future, especially as we enter an economic downturn? Probably not. And it's going to be really interesting to see what brands play in it. Uh, dog owners, nearly half say they're going to consider switching to DIY dog grooming. Um, we have a little dog, Phoebe, and it's expensive to groom her. And right now, we're, you know, we're trying to do it at home. Um, you know, I don't know if we're going to stick with doing it at home. It's kind of messy. But a lot of families might. And, you know, that's a great example. Um, you know, a third of parents saying that they will consider switching to DIY haircuts. Um, I don't know if I'm personally in that category. Um, I miss my, um, the person who cuts my hair sparkle. But, you know, who knows? Maybe uh, more and more consumers will start to do that. So I think the notion of DIY and consumer empowerment is going to continue. Again, whether it's fixing your tire um, or cooking that great meal at home or making a pizza or making bread we're entering in a new age of consumer empowerment and it's going to be incredible in some ways and it will really harm a lot of service businesses at the same time. And a lot of those businesses being harmed will certainly need to pivot their model. Let's move on to remote education. Um, you know, so many students out, out in the country in the U S and really around the world right now are going through a lot of acclimation, whether you're a college student or whether you're a third grader, you now do not have a classroom to go to every day and you have now gotten used to a new world of remote learning. Um, and what's interesting is, and we'll get into remote working in a second, but while many workers thrive from home, many students um, and really their parents are certainly struggling um, to prosper in a remote learning environment. Um, it's, it's a struggle to keep kids engaged. It's a struggle to keep their attention and Many schools, especially public schools, which might, might not have the resources or agency to be able to switch their model so quickly, have really struggled in this remote learning environment. Uh, you look at this quote from Owen saying, school is a place for building friendships, learning responsibility, and getting escape from the house, and it's all been taken away. And that, that he's realizing that school is the main source of communicating with people, so it's super hard. And, you know, we asked parents and students, what are their biggest struggles with remote learning? And, you know, distractions come up as number one, because you're not at school, you are at home, you have all of your other things that usually keep you busy during a school environment. And as a result, it can be a struggle for many people to stay connected and stay also motivated and have sort of a consistent approach um, with a remote uh, school environment. We also delve into what software products are you using and, you know, we talk about DIY and learning on your own and YouTube is at the top. Um, you've obviously seen an explosion of a tool like Zoom, which really has taken off more in the business world, but many schools have been adopting it. Some schools now are no longer able to because they had a big privacy issue that hit them. But obviously these tools are, are really relied upon uh, for students. We talked about gaming earlier and so many parents now are saying, you know what, maybe gaming is that intermediary to get my kids attention because they love gaming and how do we integrate something um, like gaming into the education curriculum uh, microsoft which owns the hit title minecraft for example has been working for years now um, on a tool which basically takes the tenants of the minecraft game and integrates it into an education environment so it'll be really interesting to see you know how they how gaming will maybe enter the the school curriculum in a remote learning world and then work you know obviously first and foremost as we all know, working from home is really for the privilege. So while many of us might complain about working at home, 
I find myself to be very fortunate to be working at home. Um, if you look actually, um, you know, on who actually can work at home, it largely is the fourth and fifth quintile of consumers in terms of income that are actually able to work from home. And working from home also isn't new. It's been trending for a while, but it is a luxury. You know, 15% of U.S. households don't even have subscriptions to broadband service which obviously would make working from home hard. So when we think about working from home, it's always important to realize that mo a lot of industries, it's not an option, and a lot of people actually really can't afford it. But that being said, those who have worked from home, a third believe they've actually been more productive working from home than from the office. Now, I've said this before, the question I actually have about that is, what happens when there's stuff to do? So what happens when the crisis ends and you can go to the gym or you can go meet a friend for coffee? Um, will people still be as productive when there's, when there's more options outside the home? And that's really gonna be the big question and something that I think is often overlooked. Um, most, comp most people do feel that, that their companies were adequately prepared for the shift to work from home. Um, and everybody believes, nearly everybody, that you know, a more flexible work arrangement would boost their morale. People want that flexibility. They want the flexibility for to work from home, work in the office, maybe uh, work somewhere else in the country or around the world after this. So again, it's gonna be interesting to see how consumers and most importantly, how companies will respond to this uh, moving, moving forward. Um, we ask consumers who work from home, what are the biggest gaps? You know, and a lot of people would say, oh, the biggest gap is they probably don't have a, a quiet workspace. They don't have a desk. Well, actually, the biggest gap is childcare. Um, those, uh, um, you know, who have young children who don't have childcare find it's nearly impossible for them to work from home with their kids tagging on their ankle. We have a lot of superhero um, parents and super moms that work for Susie that I don't know how they manage it all um, in terms of going through this, trying to meet the needs of their kids, but also um, deliver for the company. And it, it, it is really the biggest work from home gap um, that consumers kind of point to. And we talked earlier about the communications tools since the crisis, whether it be Zoom or Microsoft Teams or so many new tools um, are now actually being adopted by consumers, uh, getting into new consideration sets. Uh, many consumers probably on this webinar have never used Zoom prior to this crisis. And now, you know, you have people that are using Zoom every single day. And it's not just Zoom, it's a variety of other tools. So our last section, where's the future hold? What does a new world look like? Well, the majority of consumers actually think that the world will be different after this crisis ends. And we're now at a point in the crisis in some cities, and it's important to realize that the cycle is actually different all around the country where there's some areas like Chicago, which are just starting to get that surge and other areas like New York where the curve is flattened. But generally speaking, we're at the point where we can at least start to see a glimmer of what a future might look like and actually be able to talk about it. And 85% again, think the world will be different. In terms of when it's gonna end, you know, 40% that think it's gonna last another one to three months, and that could be optimistic. Uh, we really don't know. And I know so many of us are having these discussions, whether we're trying to plan our summer and what's the future of our kids' summer camp, or will school go back or college go back this fall? And there's just so many unknowns right now um, that it's really hard to be able to plan into the future. Uh, we ask consumers, what does over mean? So when you're saying over, how do you define it as over? I define it as over personally as there being a marketable vaccine. And that actually isn't listed here. But to me, until there's a vaccine, it's not over. Um, and maybe that's what people are talking about when they say there, there's no new cases or no, no new fatalities. Um, but obviously, a lot of people define over in different ways. And then we start to ask consumers, OK, in a world where it's over, what's different? You know, what are the first things you're going to buy after the crisis? And it's really great to see that a lot of people are saying, I'm going to eat at a restaurant. You know, and I think, you know, that is obviously one of the sectors, the, the hospitality industry that has been absolutely destroyed and to see travel and eat at a restaurant, pop out of here and go to a bar is good to see. And I think it gives hope. Car wash is very interesting. I guess people, um, you know, really their cars getting very dirty from all the shopping trips, et cetera. And they're looking forward to that. Um, coloring my hair is the first thing they'll, they'll buy. So those are people who really want to have their, their hair uh, professionally colored. Obviously dinner with friends is, is comes to the restaurant category and see a movie, which to me is really interesting. Cause again, it really goes against what a lot of us think in terms of movie theaters are dead. People miss going to the movies and they miss those type of activities. Um, we ask consumers where they think they're going to spend more or less money. And going back to the eat at home trend, you know, 
many consumers thought they're going to be spending, um, you know, more, uh, you know, at home uh, versus versus restaurants. Men actually more so do believe they're going to be spending more at restaurants and then clothing. You know, a lot of consumers have put off buying a lot of clothing, especially work related apparel. And that's something they think they're going to spend more on. And at the same time, they think they're going to be spending less on luxury items moving forward in you know, obviously entering an economic downturn, as well as things like in-person entertainment. And maybe, um, you know, that's because they don't believe that it will be a safe uh, environment coming out of this and it will take some time for them to be able to do it. And we, we double clicked on that a little bit and we asked um, how comfortable they are with attending live events once they're available. And, you know, you still have 40% of consumers right now saying they're uncomfortable going to sporting events, even if they become available. They just, there's too much unknown. The crowds are too big and it's going to be interesting to see how the live event space, which I believe the demand will be there. Um, but can they assuage consumers concerns about it? Travel. We ask consumers when they think travel will resume and, you know, nearly a third said once there's no new COVID cases, that's when it, they think that um, it's going to resume. Um, and 10% said once the government uh, said it's actually okay to travel. And we also said when you travel, what else would you pack? Uh, and we saw things like hand sanitizer, obviously, uh, rise to the front. And a side note, you know, when we did our first webinar a couple of weeks ago, we talked a lot about hand sanitizers and gloves and, and um, you know, an, uh, antibacterial, um, you know, uh, wipes and things like that. And it's not that consumers aren't buying them anymore. It's just they're adequately stocked and it's just a part of their new way of living and how they're acclimated. So we don't see the massive leaps in those categories that we saw at the onsite of the crisis. Um, we asked consumers where they would want to go then post-crisis and obviously seeing friends and family pop up. Um, and obviously some people said work, they, you know, that's where they want to go. They want to go back to work. They want to go to the gym. You know, these are the places that they really want to go back to. Um, so we're kind of running out of time, just a couple of other insights that I had, which are kind of, um, miscellaneous, but I thought it was important is I do think you're going to see an accelerated legalization of both live sports betting, um, and cannabis in States where it's not legal yet as a lot of these municipalities come under tremendous budget pressure and they need to find more tax revenues. So you're going to start to see where if it can be taxed, it could be legalized. And we saw that happen after the Great Depression with the prohibition. And I think you're going to start to see more of it. Um, and lastly, I think what you're starting to see throughout this, and this is more of a you know feel good last slide, is that many people are now getting to know their neighbors for the first time. Um, they are now you know knocking on a neighbor's door um, or, or, or texting a neighbor because they can't go out to a store anymore. And we, we kind of entered the world for a while with the onset of the internet and obviously the social web where people were looking, you know, countries and countries away for friends and communicating with people everywhere, but they didn't even know their own neighbor. And now we're at a place where we're in such more of an insulated and isolated environment that people are becoming that much more close with those who are around them, whether it's people living in their homes or their next door neighbor. And it's gonna be interesting to see um, actually how that evolves over time. So we have a ton of questions. I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. Um, I will probably um, do Q&A as long as there's a decent amount of people. We still have a ton of people um, on, on the webinar right now. Um, so, but before we get into that, we have a hub at Suzy, uh, which is at suzy.com slash COVID-19, where we are continually um, seeking out new insights and research that we're sharing with, with all of you. And there's a newsletter you can sign up for. So if you want to go there and hear more about stuff, you can do that. Um, I am Matt Britton and you can reach out to me at any time. I want to take a second just to thank all of our clients who have really stuck with us through this crisis. And, you know, we are, breaking our backs to give you um, everything that we can to make sure that you have a good feeling of where your consumer is headed. And for those of you who we aren't working with yet, uh, we'd love the opportunity to show you uh, what Suzy is all about. So now, um, and of course, people are going to get a, re a copy of the deck and the recording via email. So I'm going to dive into Q&A and uh, we'll dive into it. Um, so the first question is, consumers are stocking up on beauty and personal uh, products is strange. Why do you think it happened? I think that consumers just were stocking up on almost everything. I think that when they're going to stores, they don't know when the next time they can go into the store. They probably are taking, uh, you know, far less shopping trips. And as a result, um, when they're there, they want to get everything they actually can. So that'll be um, interesting to see. Um, the next question is what's the impact of DTC buying versus online mega stores? 
Uh, well, the impact as of right now is we are seeing um, online um, mega stores, you know, having a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, of growth where you're seeing DTC companies really struggle. A lot of the DTC companies are venture funded and are burning capital. And as a result of them burning capital, they really have to hold back so they don't actually run out of cash and you're gonna to start to see uh, their growth really drop. Um, any thoughts on some other specialty retailer types, like large specialties like Staples and Ulta? Well, Staples is interesting because if we do have an online work from home shift, um, I think Staples is really going to have a huge because consumers are gonna have to buy things for the home that they normally didn't have, as, as I personally have had to do. Um, in terms of um, in terms of Ulta, I think that you know beauty and especially a, a, a platform like Ulta, which is doing so well going into this, I think they're gonna recover. I just think it's a matter of when and when, and when the retail environment um, can can kind of go back. I have a question. Quibi CEO Meg Whitman shared in a webinar yesterday that they'll be expediting their launch of large screen viewing in May, so we're addressing it. So that's interesting and, and it makes sense. And I hadn't seen that, but it would make sense that a company like that would respond very quickly. And obviously they have great leadership. Uh, here's another comment. This morning on CNBC's Squawk Box, Jim Cramer, and speaking about the retail landscape, he said, how people get things is changing and it's not going back. What do you think we're gonna see the biggest changes or, or shifts? And you know, I think I've covered many of those here. I do think that there are many categories like online grocery shopping that probably won't go back. I think um, a lot of the more traditional specialty retailer brands are gonna have a hard time to come back. So, you know, that's a big question and frankly a presentation on its own, but hopefully I've been able to, you know, answer some of those and we're happy to dig deeper uh, with you on that, Ron. Um, what do you predict regarding cocooning and resumed focus on being at home even after they can go out? Well, I think that consumers will go out when they feel safe. And I think until they feel safe, they're gonna stay home. And again, I think some habits like cooking at home will stick long past it's safe to go out. And so I think, you know, are consumers just going to stop traveling? I do not think so. But I think it's really largely an external factor of when it's going to be safe to travel again. And until then, people aren't going to travel. When people are 100% positive that they can travel without it impacting their, their health and they can know they can go to live sporting events, I think you're going to see that all that fully return. But the question is when that is going to happen. And your guess there, um, John, is as good as mine. Uh, what are your thoughts on sustainability? Many are noticing a great impact on the environment now um, that we're traveling less. How do you think this will translate to sustainability messaging? I mean, I think brands that were, um, thanks for that question, Sonia. I think brands that were really leaning into sustainability prior really should continue afterwards. I don't think brands who didn't have sustainability as part of their ethos need to necessarily now pivot towards that because I, I don't think that it makes sense. I think it's happened. There's a good chance it'll reverse kind of coming out of it. Um, how do you think live events industry will shift to make money? Uh, well, there's a bunch of ways they're going to shift to make money. I mean, we're already starting to see, you know, Verizon partner with Dave Matthews uh, for in-home, uh, you know, concerts. I definitely do not think that live sports is going to disappear completely. I do not think the theater will disappear completely. I think that is the same frame of mind of people that said people will no longer travel internationally after 9-11 or people will no longer be able to buy homes after 2008. That, that's just an overreaction. It's inherent in human nature, especially in the spirit of youth, to travel and have new experiences. It's inherent for us to want community, which you get through live sporting events. That will not go away. Um, but when it comes back is really the question. But when it's 100% safe, if it was 100% safe, Tomorrow, you'd see NBA playoff stadiums full, um, you know, within a matter of months. And I think it's just all about people having that assurance. But I don't think the fear of getting something else will stop them. Now, if there's two or three more of these viruses, that becomes a different story. I thought your stats about the rise in webcam sales were interesting. Do you think more people go on camera? Uh, we'll see a spike in skincare and makeup sales. I don't know if we'll see um, a, a spike in makeup sales because I think, people probably aren't more prone to buying makeup um, to be on camera than they would kind of going into work. But I think it definitely is something that can help drive the business. And I know that particular category has been, has been impacted, um, especially when it comes to the more prestige brands. Um, when coming out of this crisis, are smaller store formats going to benefit versus the big box stores? I don't, I generally don't think so. I think that 
coming out of this, you're going to be in a world where we're going to be hitting an economic downturn. And I think the bigger store footprints are usually the stores that drive more volume, which means they can put more pricing pressure, which means they can offer cheaper products. So I think it's going to be harder for smaller stores to really be able to win coming out of it, but it all depends on what category you're obviously uh, talking about. Uh, it'd be a good thing to assess how this crisis, and this is from Heather, has been beneficial or detrimental to consumer financial health by income level. Yeah, I mean, that would be a great thing to look into, and that's probably something that there's already third-party research out there. Um, I'd also would be interested in knowing, Heather, how, you know, the expenses, how much expenses have been dropped by consumers, you know, over the last month or two because they're not traveling, not buying luxury goods, and in what instances has that actually really outweighed uh, the drop in income, because many people, you know, whether they're getting furloughed or getting paycheck cuts, it was interesting to see. Um, how have C-store buying uh, behaviors and shopping habits shifted? Uh, thanks, Brooke. We have a ton of data on that um, because it shifted in a lot of ways. And if you want to follow up with me um, or us, we're happy to get you that. And that goes for everyone on the phone. If there are things that you need uh, deeper information or insights on, feel free to reach out. And we're happy to kind of get that to you. What's the impact on credit card balances and demand for short-term loans? I don't have research, Heather, um, at my fingertips for that, but it's something that I would imagine you know, financial institutions have in terms of uh, debt at certain debt classes and how it's impacted uh, consumers. Um, it's not something that we did as part of this study. Uh, with the threat of the virus being predominant, has your research seen a trend away from newer natural products back to chemical products? So the answer is yes, um, and that's an anonymous uh, question, but we've seen a fairly sizable um, decrease in belief from consumers of the efficacy of organic problem uh, products in the cleaning category. Consumers want something in the home that they know can kill the virus, and that uh, to them trumps uh, their you know wherewithal and, and and I think demand of buying organic products. Organic products are also more expensive. Uh, and I think, you know, in a cost cutting environment, that's another reason. So we have seen that and we have data on that that we're happy um, to get to you. Uh, do you have info on how changing from eating out to cooking at home will impact the types of food we buy? We do have a bunch of info on that, Joe. And if you want to follow up with that, um, we've covered some of it. A lot of it is based on what they're cooking at home. So we, we when we go after research like that, we'd ask, what are you most interested in cooking at home? And then we would decode the ingredients, which would impact the type of food they buy. We've also seen things like oat milk take off based upon their shelf life. So that's an example of something that doesn't even have to do with cooking at home, but just based upon when consumers are stockpiling, um, you know, they, they took off. Uh, Adam asks, is transparency and ethics paramount for consumer brands now? I would argue it's always been important. I think where brands really need to lean in right now is being utilitarian for consumers, meaning like how can brands help consumers, whether it's giving them information or helping them laugh or smile or share to get through this. So thinking consumer first, not, not thinking about how they can advertise a unique selling proposition, but thinking about who's my consumer, what do they care about and where do I fit in and how I can help. And that's really the difference between advertising and content. Brands need to be much more content focused. What will adapting back to the office look like? Will there be changes? Uh, that's a great question and something that we're talking about a lot at Suzy right now. Um, we happen to have an office lease that is ending um, at the end of July and there's a lot of decisions being made right now in terms of how big of an office do we need? Do we need to have more square footage and a, and a higher footprint uh, for our employees? Or, or were we winning before that because it was a closer knit community and people were closer to each other? So. I, it's going to be interesting to see. We're talking to employees. We're talking, obviously, and learning a bit more about the real estate market. I think there will be changes, though. And, and some of the big banks have already announced that you know they're considering much more of a remote environment. I think it's easier said than done. But there are some companies out there which have been remote um, for a very long time. A company like IBM, for example, has been going to become a more d distributed workforce for quite some time. You mentioned a study being done on people's feelings of going to the movies. Will that be published? Uh, well, we didn't do a study particularly, Katie, on going to the movies, but we do have data on that. And if you want to follow up with that particular question, we'll send you all the specific information um, we have there for sure. Um, let's keep going. Um, how will smart robots and automated products f fare in a home care segment? Um, when you say home care, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but I think that smart products were taking off, whether it be you know your Nest Cam or your or your Ring smart doorbell in the home 
long before this has happened. And I think that's only going to continue. I saw yesterday Amazon advertising a product that allows you to take your temperature and see your, um, see your heart rate just by touching on this little device that's connected to your phone. I think we're going to see a ton of healthcare innovation uh, really take off um, in this space um, as you know, consumers become much more focused on their health um, and well-being. So let's see. I think we have more questions actually in the chat. We do. We have a ton of questions here. This comes from Joe. Do you think the focus on more cooking will result in the change of foods we buy? Again, I think the answer is yes. I think we're going to be leaning into much more ingredient brands. You know, the question really becomes what are people cooking? And that changes obviously based upon seasonality and that will impact the foods uh, that they buy. Um, so that, so that'll be interesting actually to see how that, um, builds over time. And it looks like, um, my partner in crime, Avi, um, has, uh, answered a lot of the other questions throughout this presentation. So uh, thank you to Avi for that. So we are now, I believe, at close to 2.15. I know all of you guys have, um, it's funny because if we did this webinar prior to the, the crisis, you know, I don't know how many people would have stayed uh, past the webinar, but I guess so many of you guys um, don't have the maybe the busy schedules that you used to. So things have kind of changed. But while we have time, I want to try something for those of you who, who want to still stay on the line that we've been talking about doing for quite some time. And since we still have a couple hundred people on the phone, um, if we can, and we'll see if we're able to actually pull it open, we want to kind of maybe answer some live questions. So let's see if we're actually able to do that. Um, so if you guys actually have some live questions, uh, what we could do is actually, we could actually answer them on the Suzy platform in real time. So I'll wait for some questions to come in and we'll actually see if we're able to get that done. While we're waiting, we're gonna, we're, while I'm waiting here for my colleague, we're gonna see if we have any other questions um, in that regard. Has the crisis tested the limits of online pickup? Or will online sales continue to grow disproportionately more? Um, I believe that we're gonna continue to see more share of online uh, you know, sales of products. I think it's gonna obviously vary by category, but I think that you know, we will see over time how this crisis really impacts cons uh, consumers in terms of the daily habits, but we're certainly seeing just a massive influx right now of consumers um, you know, ordering online products that maybe they haven't in the past, and I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how that changed. Um, what are your predictions with the beauty category? Uh, which areas will win and which will struggle? So I think that the beauty category, ultimately, I think long-term, again, will fully rebound. I think companies that had a digital infrastructure going into this are gonna fare better. I think companies that are more lifestyle brands, whether it be like a Revolve, that actually has the ability to go from apparel into beauty um, is gonna fare very well going into it. So I think there's going to be lots of companies that, um, Glossier, for example, a lifestyle brand that was having tremendous growth going into this, I think, and are digitally native. I think that's a brand that will, is going to be just fine coming out of it. So I really think that, um, you know, it's, it's really a big function of, um, you know, how, how the brand was faring going into this, and that will really impact uh, their ability in terms of how they're going to fare coming out of it. And again, it'll be super interesting to see uh, moving forward. So uh, let's see what else we have here. Question, will you go back to the office once? Uh, all right, that's an interesting question. Will you go back to the office once? Uh, definitely, yes. So we're actually gonna uh, put this question out right now and we'll get back to you, John, in terms of, you know, will people come back uh, to the office once things clear up? I think that was the question you were trying to ask. Do you have data on non-alcohol beverages, not just food? Uh, yes, we have a ton of that, Wendy, and if you want to follow up, we have a ton of information on beverages, whether it be the soda category or the juice category, um, sparkling water, uh, bottled water, etc. cetera. Um, so those are all things that we can actually share. Um, and I think that's it. I'll take one more and then we'll get going. Um, so any insights on the convenience store channel? We already covered that. I think that's it. We have other questions that I think are, are kind of duplicative. Um, all right, here's another one. They keep coming in. Uh, of the products and services that have suffered the biggest losses, which activities do you think they should prioritize uh, to work on in this downtime? For example, work on their websites, develop customer newsletters. I think, Mara, you have a great point there. I think that, um, you know, consumers are, you know, generally speaking, or businesses rather, 
trying to figure out what they do. And if they have the capital resources that basically allow them to, um, you know, invest in the infrastructure, invest in their products during this, when they can't go to market, I think it's great. It's certainly something we're doing at Suzy in terms of stepping on the gas um, on our product development. Um, but we're also going to market at the same time. But I think that's, you know, it'll be interesting in terms of what companies really take this opportunity to basically improve their infrastructure, which I think is what you're getting at. What's the trend in snacking? Well, the biggest trend in snacking is people are snacking more. Um, you know, th thanks for that question. More and more consumers are eating snacks. There's more snacks in the household. People are home more. Um, and because of it, you know, that we're definitely seeing uh, more of an increase um, in snacking for sure. Are people more lean towards lower and more affordable products? I think John, overall, the answer to that is yes. I think that there are some brands where consumers might veer towards private label or value brands, but there's other categories where I think premium brands will, will come roaring back. So I think I wouldn't put too much into what they're doing right now because there's so many factors at play, whether it be the economic uncertainty, which well will exist after this, we don't know to what degree, as well as supply chain availability. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what changes. Before the crisis, CBD products were on the rise across categories. Has a consumer interest changed? So I actually saw a study, uh, I think yesterday, in terms of, in Las Vegas at least, uh, you know, cannabis delivery was booming and usually CBD follows a similar trend. So I do believe C the CBD category is gonna be one that, to the extent that they've had issues uh, with lack of retail availability, I think that they're definitely going to be um, booming back coming out of this because that was a very hot category going into it. And again, I think that on the cannabis side, more states are going to legalize it more quickly because they need the tax revenues. What will consumers look for from hotels to demonstrate they are safe? Well, it's interesting, Lorraine. I, I saw a story Marriott is coming out with commercial level uh, sanitizers that they're putting in hotel rooms. I think any restaurant, any hotel, any airline is going to have to put that front and center. I think it's going to just kind of be a prerequisite for many consumers that they get assurances that, you know, that wherever they go, they're not going to be disproportionately exposed. So I think there's going to have to be a lot of messaging. I mentioned on their very first webinar, is there a good housekeeping seal of approval for, um, you know, for venues? So does Purell come up with a stamp of approval that could be on the corner of Olive Garden's messaging? So consumers know that Purell has approved their sanitation measures or does American Airlines do that? So I think we're gonna definitely see that because that's something that whether it impacts if consumers fly or not, it's a different story. They're probably at least gonna wanna know, um, you know if, if, if it's actually available. So that's gonna be really interesting in terms of how it's gonna impact uh, what they're gonna do in that regard. Okay. I don't know about you, but I need to get a drink of water. Uh, this has been great. We are gonna be doing these webinars. Um, and I, I see um, some, of my, uh, some of my colleagues that are slacking me right now. It's great that we have a whole great support team behind us. So I wanna give a special shout out to our customer success team and, um, and our creative team and everyone who's helped us done this. So I just wanna thank everybody um, for joining, spending so much time. Again, I'm Matt Britton. If you have any questions or anything I can do, I will flash my contact info um, on the screen really quickly. Um, and then I'm happy to basically follow up, get you guys whatever you need, and uh, hope you guys are all managing well through these crazy times right now. Um, and wishing you guys the best of luck in the weeks and months ahead. Looking forward to meeting everyone uh, when the dust clears and the dust will clear. So again, uh, I'm Matt Britton from Suzy. Feel free to reach out with any questions and everybody take care. Thank you.